Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. With me today is Heath Jones, author of Music Technology 101 from Hal Leonard, and the executive editor and founder of MutechTeacherNet.com. After meeting at the Ohio Music Educators Association conference last winter and having loads of great conversation, uh, we decided that we would continue this conversation on this very show. Uh, I've done my best to edit these recordings into one coherent episode. I lost a little bit of audio in the file transfer process, and uh, we had a couple hiccups with scheduling too, so we recorded over three different sessions. We had lots of great conversation, and I preserved most of it and learned a lot. So I've uh, spliced it all together as best I can here. Hope you enjoy it. I don't actually personally know like how you kind of came to this point. I mean, you're teaching a full music technology schedule, right? So um, not many people start there unless that's sort of been developed before them. How, what was the path to that? And then like, what exactly does your day-to-day schedule look like? Well, I, <laughs> yeah, I tell people what a long, strange journey it has been. Yep. Uh, and nobody uh, is more <laughs> surprised or shocked that I'm doing what I'm doing now than I am. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, growing up, you know, when I was, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, um, you know, I loved, I mean, I loved music, listening to the radio. Um, you know, my parents, uh, my mom was a elementary school teacher and, you know, my dad worked in a grocery store and, but they loved music. The radio was on all the time. Two groups in particular, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. They had a tenor sax player, Clarence uh, Clemens. It's, and I love the sound of that saxophone. And, uh, and then Billy Joel um, had a sax player. I should know his name. Um, but, uh, you know, Just the Way You Are is a Billy Joel song. It has a big sax solo in it. And um, so when I got to the age where I could sign up uh, to be in the band, it was like, I'm joining the band and I want to play the saxophone. And um, so, yeah, so like sixth grade, you know, I started beginning band um, and I was a band kid, um, you know, all the way. Uh, so, and I went to a, a really small rural school in South Carolina. And so my band director actually had the same band director from seventh grade through 12th grade. Um, who I want to give a shout out to his name is Lane Moore. And I just found out, um, that Mr. Moore passed away mm-hmm. just a, a few days ago. Um, and he was such an influential person, uh, you know, in my life. He, uh, I wanted to be a band director because of him. Um, uh, and if not for that, uh, you know, I probably would have been, I'm think probably an auto mechanic. Like I really like cars. Uh, we had auto mechanics in my family. And so I grew up, uh, you know, working around the shops and stuff. And, but, you know, he was the one that, uh, was like, you know, you could go do music in college. And I was like, really? Uh, but anyway, he was, um, so in a lot of ways, like I wanted to grow up and be like Mr. Moore and be a band director. And, um, and so that's what I did. I, I got my undergrad at the university of Georgia and I got a master's degree at the university of South Carolina and started as an assistant band director in 96, I think. Um, and at Sumter High School in South Carolina. And then we went to Tennessee for a couple of years where I was a band director at Hickson High School, just outside of Chattanooga before I went back to Sumter uh, as the uh, head band director. And was there at Sumter for seven years before we moved to Georgia where I came to another high school uh, here in Gwinnett County, Peachtree Ridge High School. Um, and I was doing every, I was doing exactly what I always wanted to do. I just wanted to be a band director. That was it. And I, and I loved being a band director. Um, but about 2006, well, our, you know, our first child, uh, Abby, was born in 2002. So by 2006, uh, 2007, you know, she was starting to play, you know, like little league soccer when she was in kindergarten and, you know, having, uh, you know, 
ballet recitals and stuff. And that was the first time that, uh, you know, I remember one time in particular that, you know, we had a, a big marching competition on a Saturday. And so I was uh, at the practice field with the band. You know, we we're doing our, our, our last run throughs of the show and getting ready for the competition. And I could actually hear my daughter at her soccer game, which was at a park like right across the street from the mm. school. And, um, and that was the one of the moments I can remember going. I, I, like, I feel like I should be there and not here with the band. So at the end of that year, I had an opportunity to go to a middle school as a band director. Um, and I thought, you know, if I go to middle school band, I don't, you know, there's no Friday night football games, uh, no booster club meetings, uh, you know, Saturday competitions, you know, spring band trips, um, you know, and how hard can middle school band be after doing high school band for, you know, 15 years? <laughs> and, uh, it didn't, it didn't take me too long, um, to realize how difficult <laughs> it was to be a middle school band director. I, you know, I called one of my former colleagues who was an assistant with me at the high school, uh, who had started, uh, as a middle school director and then went back to middle school. Yeah. You know, I called her and, um, and I was like, they don't, they don't know anything. And she went, yes, that's, that's why they're called beginners. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is really hard. So, but when that happened, when I first got to that middle school, the way the schedule was set up, you know, we had two sections of each grade level. So you had two sixth grade band classes, two seventh grade and two eighth grade band classes. But the year that I was there, there weren't enough kids in the eighth grade band to have two sections. So the principal came and said, S to fill out your teaching schedule, we're going to give you a general music class. And I was like, no, not general music. Um, because, you know, it's they just kind of, you know, randomly assign students to that class who, um, let's say, have varying levels of commitment to <laughs> wanting to learn that content. Um, but while I was at the high school in Gwinnett County, Gwinnett County for a number of years had uh, established music technology programs for our high schools. And the high school I was at had all this equipment uh, for a music technology lab, you know, Apple desktop computers. They had uh, MIDI synthesizers, um, you know, they had, uh, you know, GarageBand, Reason, um, you know, all the software. And I would use it every now and then. Like when, if I was teaching an AP music theory class, we'd go in and use like Finale or something to do some stuff. But anyway, so when I was doing this music tech class, I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to figure out something to get the kids somehow engaged or interested in what we were doing. So right next to the band room or around the corner from the band room, there was a PC lab. Um, and during that block that I had the general music class, I would just reserve the PC lab and I started taking the kids over there. And, um, one of our tech people at school, uh, who is, uh, is still a professional musician, but left a life of uh, studio performance to go into, uh, uh, education technology. So I went to him and I said, can you push audacity out to all the computers in that one lab and he was like yeah well, i can do that so he pushed audacity out and then we'd go in the lab and we would go find anything on the internet that was free um like fruity loops at the time was big so you know yeah. now it's fl studio because that sounds much more uh professional than fruity loops but so you know we download loops we talk about you know the history of rock and roll and and trace different um you know musicians from like James Brown to, you know, Prince and Michael Jackson to, you know, current artist, uh, Bruno Mars or whatever. Um, and I was just making it up. And, um, but I, I called our fine art supervisor for the County. And I was like, I know we don't have music technology programs for the middle school. I said, but I also know that there are some high schools that aren't fully utilizing the equipment that they have. Is there any way, we, I could get my hands on some of that equipment and why don't we start a music tech program for middle school? And, uh, my principal was 
all for it. Sounds great. Um, the fine arts director said, well, we can't really just move that inventory from high school to middle school, but, you know, we're going to work on something. I'll let you know. So the following year, or actually the summer between that, we, uh, the middle school that I'm at now, McConnell Middle School, and four other middle schools, somehow, I don't know if it was a grant or, or something they got, but they installed these music tech labs uh, at these five middle schools. And we were one of them. And so now I had a music technology lab and it wasn't called music technology because there was no curriculum. Um, it was, I think technically it was still general music, but now we were doing it uh, in a computer lab. So the only problem at this point was I'm not a tech person <laughs> at all. Um, so, you know, that first semester uh, that we were in that music tech lab, the students figured out uh, fairly quickly, like if they just wanted a free day, someone just had to raise their hand and go, hey, Mr. Jones, we can't hear any sound coming out of our computer because it would take me basically the rest of the period just to try to figure out why the sound wasn't working um, <laughs> before I had any idea about inputs and outputs and signal flow and any, I was just like, I don't know, let's start pressing knobs and turning buttons. Um, so, but, you know, the students were uh, fascinated because all the, you know, all the computers were, uh, you know, Mac desktops. So every other computer in, in the school is, you know, just a PC black box uh, Dell or whatever. So the kids that were in the class were like, oh, this is so cool. We've got like these nice computers and we have these synthesizers at each of the workstations. Um, and so, I, you know, I went into teaching that the following year. Uh, and I was still doing it for just one section of eighth grade. Um, and so that second year, they went, well, now that we have these labs in the middle schools, we probably should have a curriculum. Um, and we need uh, some folks to get together and create a curriculum. Um, and I don't know how I ended up uh, on the committee, but I did. So it was me and uh, a couple other people that sat down. And, um, and, you know, looking back, I don't know that what we did was intentional, but I think it was the only way that we knew how to do it. So, and what I mean by that was when it came to go, okay, we have this, uh, we have this class and we're going to create a curriculum. What's it going to be? Well, for me, I didn't know, I knew very little about technology. Um, you know, as a band director, I, I didn't need technology. All I needed was like a Dr. Beat. Uh, you know, in, a, in a, a strobo tuner at the front of the room. I mean, that was pretty much it. So when it came to creating the curriculum, um, I had to, I gravitated to what I knew, which was music. So if the curriculum was going to be centered on kind of teaching technology or, you know, teaching the elements and the equipment that you might see in a recording studio, I had no idea you know, how to use a mixer or a compressor or how to really use, you know, an EQ. I thought it was just like knobs you got to play with on a fancy stereo or whatever. So the curriculum from the beginning was rooted in music and music creation. Um, and one of, um, and then I did start reaching out to people because like I said, the high schools had an established curriculum and there were several schools that had well-developed programs. Ken Simpson was ran the music technology program at Brookwood High School and had been was probably one of the first ones uh, in Georgia, uh, certainly if not uh, one of the first ones, um, you know, in the southeast of the country who had started the program. Um, and then um, Marion English, who was at North Gwinnett High School, uh, who was still uh, teaching at the time. But I went to both of them and like said, you know, what do you do in music technology? How are you doing this? And so they were they were super helpful. And then another thing that was really influential for me was I found a book. Uh, the book's called The Dawn of the Doll. And it's written by uh, Dr. Adam Patrick Bell, who's on the faculty, uh, I believe, at the University of Calgary and was one of the only college level um music educator people that I could find 
that was approaching music technology from the standpoint of music education. And uh, it's a great book, but one of the, the biggest takeaways I took away from that book was, you know, he said the technology is the instrument that you're teaching. And I got that because, you know, as a band director or an orchestra director, you know, we're not a how to play a trump how to play a trumpet teacher. You know, we are teaching students how to perform music. Um, you know, I was a two. Uh, you know, I started off on saxophone. Uh, long story, but I ended up playing saxophone and tuba in high school. Um, when I got to college, uh, University of Georgia, they offered me a little scholarship to play tuba. Um, they did not extend that for my saxophone prowess, so I officially became a tuba player. But you know, as the band director, I have to understand how to teach students how to play a flute and a clarinet and a trombone and trumpet and percussion and so forth. So when I started, you know, once I read that book, I was like, okay, this is the technology is another instrument that I have to learn how to teach kids how to use to create or perform music. Um, and that was really huge. So with that, I think that really helped to sort of uh, refine the curriculum that we were working on. And eventually uh, we did like a local curriculum, uh, I think a year or two years later, the State Department of Education here in Georgia, um, uh, Jessica Booth is the fine arts specialist uh, with our State Department of Education. And she was going through a process of uh, revising and updating the state level uh, curriculum standards for all the fine arts. Um, and I ended up on the committee that was to develop the curriculum for middle school music technology, which at the time it didn't exist. So that committee got together and we created these standards uh, that were very closely aligned to the NAFME national standards um, for music education and music technology. And we got to work um, like literally side by side, the high school uh, curriculum folks were like at a table on the other side of the room. So we were able to kind of work with them to develop a curriculum that we could start at the middle school that would, um, you know, the kids could follow into the high school, even though our students, if they want to take music technology at the high school, they don't have to have it in middle school as a prerequisite. Um, but that's, um, that, that's kind of the, the root of how it happened is, you know, for, for me, it's, you know, the music tech definitely comes from the standpoint of music creation and all of the other sort of technology pieces are, um, you know, it's just like different techniques. Uh, you know, if, if you're teaching beginning band, you don't start off by teaching vibrato. You know, it's it's basic tone, you know, how to put the <clears throat> instrument together, yep. you know, how to make it sound. And um, and so that's kind of, you know, what how I approach music technology, uh, particularly at the middle school. You know, it's real basic. You know, how, how do you create a rhythm? What is rhythm? Um, you know, what are the, the tools we have to create rhythms? And then we'll move into, um, you know, usually form is next because, you know, we talk about um, – like patterns, like, you know, when we're kids, we learn visual patterns. Uh, you get the little handouts that are like a picture of a dog and a dog and a cat, and a dog and a dog and a cat, then a dog and a dog and blank, what comes next? So we're taught how to recognize visual patterns, um, but we're never really taught necessarily how to recognize oral patterns. Right. But music is full of repetition and patterns. So we move from rhythm into form because we take that repetition and then patterns of repetition. And then from there, it we move into melody and harmony and, you know, expression. But the curriculum is definitely rooted in music creation, more so than what people probably commonly refer to as music production. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you kind of put this all together because I'm also, you know, I've got one foot in this general music middle school world, but I'm dominantly teaching band, but, you know, I, I often hear it spoken by, you know, people in our, in our domain that, you know, you want to teach music, not necessarily the tool. Um, 
but uh, but you know it's interesting also that you've sort of drawn a parallel to the instrumental performance part as well which is because i very much identify with what you're saying there too i mean i I'd really try to de-emphasize uh the way that i talk about the you know individual technique of the instruments to my band students like it's um, a means to get into a goal and sometimes you have to speak to that more than other times but always to, for me it's like about a sound concept about a tone concept about um a narrative and a story we're telling with that tonal concept as you know expressed through our balance and our intonation and our blend so um yeah it's just really interesting to hear you kind of make that parallel that at the core of all of these different domains we have these tools and then we have these uh, kind of deeper and more underlying idea, musical ideas that we're really trying to teach using these tools. And that's how I explain my interest in, in music technology. I think like in my own story kind of comes like a, a lot of, you know, popular music styles that were sort of more like a part of my love of music early on. Um, you know, I, I did end up getting a classical percussion performance master's degree, but that was sort of like a later area of interest for me. Um, so it's always felt natural to make the kinds of music styles that are made in a digital audio workstation. Um, so I'm, I'm just basically, this is a long winded way of saying I'm 100% totally there with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, even like as a percussionist, if, you know, if you're teaching uh, like a student, how to play a timpani, like where you strike the head of the drum is going to determine the sound that comes out of it you know this is what happens when you hit it in the center of the head you know here's what happens when you hit it right at the edge and you know like for a timpani you want to find that kind of sweet spot where you get the tone from the instrument you want and i think that's really similar to how you can talk to students about microphone placement um you know let's say you're trying to mic a guitar amp well where you place that microphone how close you put it to the amp you know, where you put it, uh, you know, makes a difference in the sound. And I think um, that's very similar to what we do when we're teaching students, you know, tone production on their instrument. How do you get the best sound out of the instrument that you're playing? Yeah, totally. So you've ended up at a point now where you're teaching just completely music technology. You have a new book. I guess I can't really call the book new. It came out over the summer, right? Uh, it came out last March. I, I, gosh, I even forgot about this. Wait, I, I, I really? Was it, was it out last spring? This is, uh, yeah. uh time has, has Wait, been forever ruined for us. I know for it was today, March 26th. You know what? I think it came out almost, I think it was a year ago yesterday. I think it was March 25th last oh, Well, happy wow, anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, the book is called Music Technology 101. There's lots of like books that help that are there to help teachers navigate this space. What do you feel like was the the hole in, in the music technology education space that you were trying to fill? Like, what was the need you saw for a book? And how did your how did this whole like your whole pathway into this space? Like, how did you sort of like use that experience to fill the pages of this book? Well, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, it was sort of interesting because I think, so the book's published by Hal Leonard. And I do want to mention, there's another book out there called Music Tech 101, and it's written by a guy named Bruce Lasco. And that book is wonderful. Like, I, I have a class set of the that book that I bought for, um, for like, my advanced level students. But Hal Leonard, and I think it's an Alfred publication, so... Uh, but Hal Leonard came to me maybe in 2019 with an idea about, they were like, Hey, we're thinking about publishing a book about, you know, music technology. Someone said that maybe you would be a person to contact about writing it. Would you be interested? And I was like, yeah, well, yeah, sure. Um, and so I sort of kind of started this, um, you know, they wanted like a table of content. So, you know, I already had developed a lot of stuff um, as far as curriculum went because of the work I was I had done with Gwinnett County and the Department of Education. Uh, and I'd gone out, um, I guess 2017 is when I first started 
2018 maybe was the first conference I did that was uh, it was NAFME the NAFME conference in uh, Dallas about music tech um, but they had talked to me about writing a book and I was like yeah yeah um, and then <laughs> I never really got going on it because you know I, I had all this information but how do you put it together uh, in a book um, and you know the COVID thing started coming along and I sort of was dragging it out. And so finally, um, you know, they were like, okay, if you're going to write the book, write the book. If you're not going to write the book, that's cool. Just let us know. Um, and that was the summer that we were, the spring and summer that we were going into COVID lockdown. Right. So I had lots of time on my hands and I was like, well, no, let's, let, okay, I'm, I'm going to write this thing. So um, I, maybe COVID's the reason ultimately that, that I did it because I had time. Um you know, I had time on my hands where I could actually sit down and focus on it. So, but one of the, you know, w one of the things that I tell any teacher that I've talked to uh, about this, but because, you know, when I, even at, here in Georgia, um, I took over as the music technology chair for GMEA uh, at about the same time. I think it was 2020. 2019 about that time I took over as the music tech chair and up until that time if you said music technology in terms of you know our state association or conference what they were talking about was you know mm -hmm. how can you implement new technologies in the band classroom or orchestra classroom or general music classroom um, it wasn't really talked about as a specific content area so as that started to develop uh, here in our state and people would ask me, you know, so what do you teach? And I go, well, I teach music technology. And they would sort of look at me for a second and go, um, okay, so what, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, what is that exactly? Um, and so, you know, when I started, uh, you know, developing this stuff, um, and this, by the way, um, might be the introduction to another book that I'm trying to work on now. But, you know, one of the issues is, if you have a music education degree that you've gotten from, you know, your state, uh, you know, university, school, wherever, um, you were not taught how to teach music technology. Um, you were taught how to teach band, orchestra, choir, general music, you know, um, cause people will say how, you know, how did you get certified to teach music technology? And I go, I'm not, I went, nobody is that I know of. Um, I said, you know, I have a music education degree, but I didn't know anything about it. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, going back to the curriculum that was really interesting is as I look back on it, I was given an opportunity to create what I was going to teach. This, uh, not that I was the only one, there were, you know, other people on the committee, but I, I got to develop this new curriculum. But none of us that have a music ed degree have been taught how to teach this as a content area. And, and this goes way back. Like I, uh, you know, we can go back to, you know, the 1950s when the recording industry, you know, really exploded and you can see how quote unquote popular music and recording went one way and the university conservatory model stayed on the same course that it's been on for 250 years. But, you know, those were, considered two different things. So one of the, and like in the preface in the beginning of the book, one of the things I, I emphasize and I emphasize to any group of teach, music educators I'm talking to is if you don't feel, if you feel qualified to teach this for the first time, you're probably just kidding yourself because you're not, <laughs> none of us are, none of us have been, you know, for the most part have been taught how to do this um, unless you know, your personal background, you had interest in recording or, you know, popular music or, or whatever. So the first, so some of it is the first part of the book is explaining how, when I came at this, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I w we were literally, you know, the old saying, you know, flying the plane as you're building it uh, was, was what was happening. Um, so there was, no one who could have felt more unprepared than I did when I started doing it. So part of the beginning is don't be afraid of this. And then, like I mentioned before, a lot of 
um, like what we've talked about, I do relate what I do to how I was teaching band. And I, I actually I taught band and orchestra both for, uh, I guess, the first four years of, of, of uh, my professional life. Um, so a lot of the approach, one of the things that I think that I tried to do in the book is present this in a way that makes sense to music educators. Um, so if it's written in, uh, I think a very easy to understand way, like I, I, you know, I picked up books on, you know, things like, you know, compression and sound envelopes and filters. And there are all these mathematical equations and graphs. And I'm like, I just close the book <laughs> and move on. So it's written from the perspective of a music educator. But no, it's, um, you know, because teachers will often ask about, you know, uh, you know, what, what are some apps uh, that, uh, that I need or that will be useful? And it's, uh, you know, the, the, we, we will never suffer from uh, a lack of resources. A lot of times when it comes to apps and stuff, it's, the problem is that, um, you can't find a good app to use. It's just so many of them yeah. that uh, it's almost like doing a, a Google search. It's like, whoa, that's, I don't need 5 million results. Uh, like, give me, give me two. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it can kind of be, uh, you know, a little overwhelming sometimes. So, and I do, like in a lot of my sessions and stuff that, um, that I do, I talk a lot about Soundtrap and I talk a lot about Note Flight and, um, but I always, you know, will preface that and say those aren't the only ones. Uh, you know, there are other, uh, you know, cloud-based and, uh, you know, dolls and notation programs. So, um, you know, if there's something that works good for you personally, uh, you know, use that one. So uh, any of the apps and stuff I talk about is stuff that I've used and, and, and I like. Um, so, but... Yeah, but when it comes, a couple of apps uh, that I kind of have come across in the last uh, six months or so that I think are just really super cool. And I think uh, one in particular can be really useful for, uh, you know, not just specifically music technology courses, but can be really useful for, you know, your performance based classes like band, choir, and orchestra. But one of them um, is called Play Score 2. Um, which is uh, was developed by a company in England, I believe. And, you know, a lot of people may be familiar with uh, XML files, uh, how you can take like a piece of sheet music. And it used to be you could take a piece of sheet music and you could scan it. And then you could take that scanned image and then import it into, you know, Finale or some other uh, sort of notation program. And uh, even with, uh, more recent iterations of XML files, there's always an issue of when you scan, you know, a score uh, and try to convert that into MIDI data, there's still some, always some tweaks and fixes you have to go in to make. So, but this app, uh, PlayScore 2, really just uh, amazed me at how quickly it works. So if you can imagine, say you have a, um, you know, a piece of sheet music uh, and you have the app, and you open it and there's a camera on it and you take your camera camera and snap a photo of the sheet music and like literally within seconds it is playing the sheet music right back to you along with uh you know kind of a, a playhead or cue line that's following the music along um and it's not just that it plays it back that quickly but there's a little slider you can change the tempo um almost immediately uh, to make it go slower or faster, you can grab uh, like just a section of it uh, if you want it to just loop a section of the sheet music. Um, and uh, you can even go in, uh, you know, let's say, I, I think it could be 
particularly useful for like choir directors. Like I shared this with our choir director at my school. So, you know, you know, a lot of choir directors uh, have to serve, you know, particularly in their classrooms have to serve as their own, uh, you know, piano accompanist uh, along with working with their choir. Um, and the thing that's so cool about the play score too, is like they can take a picture of that score and it may be an SATV format uh, you know, you could have a score like solo and ensemble, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, band and orchestra, you know, a lot of teachers want to, uh, encourage their kids to participate in solo and ensemble, but you know, how do you find, uh, it's not always easy, easy to find an accompanist to, uh, you know, play the piano part along with you or whatever. Um, but with play, uh, play score two, you can take the photograph and in that SATB format, uh, you can actually independently choose the sound that you want for each uh, staff. So it could be piano or it has a range of, of instruments you could choose. So, um, you know, almost instantly, because, uh, you know, if you're, you know, if you have stuff like smart music, which is great. So if you have smart music um, and there's something in the smart music library that you can use, you can get the accompaniment parts and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, a lot of schools, a lot of your repertoires and file cabinet shows actually still sheet music. So if you don't have smart music or you just find like, you know, maybe a piece of uh, a piece that you haven't performed in a while and you just have it in sheet music, you can just grab the score, take a picture of it. And within seconds, you've got a, uh, you know, an audio file. It's a MIDI, a MIDI file actually, but we'll play back. Um, and then you can share that file with your students. So the students could have, uh, you know, an audio uh, copy if they wanted to practice or sing along at home. Um, you know, even with, if you say you scan something for uh, a solo and a piano accompaniment, you can mute the solo line. So you just have the piano accompaniment part that can be shared with a student to practice along with. Um, and there's lots of other, I mean, there's, it's one of those things that uh, I think uh, there's a number of different ways you could probably uh, apply that to each individual kind of situation. But uh, play score two, I think it's really, really cool. Um, you can't, you know, for teachers, I think uh, there's like, uh, I think I, maybe it's, I'm not sure if it works, actually, if it works on a subscription basis or if it it's does. like a one time app. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, subscription fee. But, yeah, it's a subscription, but I'm pretty sure like the student version is free for students. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, I, I was first introduced to that maybe last fall, and um, but yeah, Play Score too, I think is super cool, and and it and it really is just because of how quickly and efficiently it works. Um, so it's not like you have to, you know, actually scan it and then you know, transfer the file into a notation software or like it's right there. That's, so that's usually what really I cool. want to do with it when I'm using one of these kinds of like XML scanning apps. But what they've done is they've, uh, it obviously does all of that exporting kind of stuff. Like you can export it, yeah, yeah. you know, any standard file type you would expect to work in a digital audio workstation. But um, they've also kind of prioritized this sort of like instant playback. Like it really does feel like you can instantly, whether, whether you actually are like trying to use it as an accompaniment to practice along to, or if you're the kind of person who just wants to quickly check to see how accurately um, it, it did your scan, it's pretty quick to start hitting the play button. And I've been pretty impressed. I've been doing a lot of testing. I'm kind of drafting a blog post about my experiences using PlayScore. And um, it's, you know, there's a lot to love. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it about the time it takes to download like a document file, after you take the photo, it, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, so yeah, definitely check out that episode because I think it's a super cool uh, app. And like I said, a lot of applications for, you know, performance based classes, uh, you know, both as like with a group and with individuals, yeah, um, that kind of thing. So, and the other thing that I think is uh, really, really super cool uh, is, uh, and it's not exactly well. It is an app. Anyway, it's called Jack Trip. I don't know if you have you heard of that. I have heard of it. Um, yeah. So yeah, Jack Trip is like I remember when the COVID thing, uh, you know, all first started, right? And um, 
And some people may be familiar with like Eric Whitaker's you know, like virtual choir that he started actually some years back. And, it, you know, it was like pretty amazing because people are like, oh, wow, he's, you know, bringing all of these, you know, people together from around the globe and, and they're performing together uh, in virtual reality. And, um, and it was pretty cool. But, um, you know, a lot of us uh, non leg musicians don't uh, uh, there's a lot of things out there you know we don't really understand what it takes to make things happen that we you know, hear and see but um, you know when the COVID came out and an app what's that app acapella I think is what it was called, was called where you know, people could use their phones to record themselves you know playing a quintet or quartet and then it would produce this kind of um performance where everything you know all the different tracks from the different videos were lined up and then i started to see uh, you know band directors and choir directors and orchestras that were going oh well you know my principal wants us to do a virtual spring concert you know, how do i get all of my students to play together and uh, perform on zoom or you know i'll just run my band rehearsal zoom and i was going no 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 stop time out time out like it doesn't work that way um because and I, you know at the time you know i was telling people too i was like you know th i said here's do this experiment you know like you your spouse whoever like you can just be sitting on different ends of your couch in your home um and call each other on your cell phone and have a conversation on your cell phone sitting next to each other so that you can actually hear your real voices and then hear what's coming through on the cell phone. Um, I'm like, there's the lag, uh, you know, understand that when we're transferring all the data that somewhere the data is leaving our computers and going to, you know, some server who knows where or to a satellite that then it's the payment back to another server back to us. So it literally takes time to, for this data to travel around, even though it travels super, super fast. And um, so, you know, a lot of people will understand the idea of latency. So the, the problem is if the latency is all equal between everybody participating, then you can sort of adjust to that. Anybody who's a marching band director and has experience, you know, phasing problems on the field where, you know, the, the, one group way on the back side of the field and another group that's on the front side of the field, you, they're trying to get their sound to line up. And it's because that takes time for, that's latency. It takes time for uh, sound to travel. <clears throat> so, you know, I'll tell people you can't, you can't do Zoom <clears throat> because even though you all might be in the same town, uh, where that data is traveling doesn't mean it's going to go to the nearest data center. Like I'm just outside of Atlanta and there's a, um, like a big Google data center in Atlanta. Uh, but that doesn't mean all the data that's being handled around Atlanta is going to that data center. It could be going to one on the West coast or in Canada. So it's like, stop trying to do the virtual, um, band rehearsals. Like it just doesn't work. Um, you know, or, or you call a group of people in your family and try to sing happy birthday together over the mm -hmm. telephone. It just doesn't work. And, um, but then I heard about this um, app called Jack Trip that had, um, and there, you know, there were some other sort of cloud-based dolls that were trying to figure out how to, how to do this, uh, where you could in real time, um, like record or get the audio where the latency was minimal enough that you could actually perform together, uh, you know, but it, it was not easy to get to. So anyway, Jack Trip came along. If, if I understand the story correctly, the person that developed it, their their kid was like in middle school choir and, you know, participating in, I mean, middle school is hard enough, but, you know, participating in the choir was like a huge part of his middle school experience. It was really important to him. And when COVID came along and they weren't in school together and the choir couldn't sing together anymore, like it was really having a pretty big impact. So uh, one of his parents was like, you know, a software engineer or, or whatever. And they figured out a way to have multiple people, uh, you know, as much as, you know, 50, even as much as maybe a hundred people who could all be, uh, 
like an audio version of Zoom where you could be performing together in real time remotely and they got the latency below the threshold of human perception. So, um, and I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. So, uh, and it, there is like a geographic limitation to it, but it's like 500 miles. Yeah. Um, so Jack trip is cool. Um, but let's say for example, you know, if you're an orchestra director and you wanted to have a sectional with your violas, um, you know, even today when a lot of people are back in person, uh, there's always that issue, you know, you have a sectional after school and there's always that one kid you're waiting on their parent to kind of pick them up because, you know, there was traffic was bad or, or whatever. I mean, it happens. Um, but like with Jack trip, you could do like a virtual sectional where you could be, you know, at your school or you could be at your home and your students could all be at their homes. And you could do a sectional in real time with the audio where, you know, you could be at your home as a teacher and say, one, two, ready, play. And they all play together uh, with the, the latency enough that you can do it at the time. Like, that's, that's crazy. So uh, if you haven't uh, discovered Jack Trip, I would check out. I, that's the other thing I would recommend. Check out Jack Trip. Uh, it's just like Jack, J-A-C-K, yeah. Trip. I'm going to link um, the, the website in the show notes. I'm going to link another thing too. I'll put a YouTube video in the notes to this episode. Um, bass player Christian McBride has a video where he's like sound checking it, like sort of doing a kind of, ex it, it very concisely explains like how Jack Tripp works around the problems that have persisted in this area. And then it kind of has like a little bit of him and uh, I think a pianist kind of playing together live from not in the same room as one another, just to kind of show off you know, and this is like a um, Christian McBride. I think the world of him as a bass player. So this is someone who has a very, very, very solid timing, who is able to, uh, you know, work collaboratively with another musician, not in the same space. Yeah, and my my daughter and I have actually tried this. Um, she's a, a sophomore music ed major at the University of Georgia, and she's about thirty five miles away, and we've just kind of messed around with it too, and it's it works. It's, it's very very impressive. So. Yeah, I would definitely say check those out. All right, so I'm going to kind of um, interpret my own segment a little differently this week. Typically, I do an app pick. I actually want to um, highlight two developers this week. Um, both are uh, companies that are Ukrainian and that make excellent software. Um, I guess I would consider them both to be sort of like productivity and utility software. And like right now, I just want to call out these companies um, because uh, I think like I depend on their apps uh, like almost more than any other company that I can think of where like a company has like numerous apps that I that I use. So I'll, I'll just like highlight a couple apps from each company. So, and I think I'm saying this wrong. I think it's pronounced Riedel or Riedel. It's R-E-A-D-D-L-E. And they are the makers of a couple of great apps. PDF Expert is one of them. Uh, so the Spark email app is another one. They've got a great iOS app that is um, great for managing your Google Drive and your Dropbox stuff. The app is called Documents. And I'd say of all of these apps, the one that I am most dependent on is the Spark Mail app. And it's, I mean, I mentioned it in my book and the email section of my book. Like it's just for long now been my preferred email client. You can put uh, any email account in it. So I have my personal Gmail account and my school account, which is using Microsoft Outlook as the you know, um, as the service, but spark mail lets me plug both of them in there. And it just adds a ton of great features that are modern email features. You can snooze emails to show up in your inbox at a later date. You can, uh, set an email, you can send it to a to do app and give it a due date and a deadline. You can, um, reply to something, but schedule the reply to send when you at a certain time in the future, you can have it remind you if someone did not reply to a message, uh, you can send uh, pretty much every major like task app and note taking app. You can like plug in your credentials and then it will like, you can program a keyboard shortcut to send it there. So like if you use Evernote, you can have like an Evernote button customized and it'll just save the message to your Evernote. Um, I just use this as my way to basically triage my email and get it down to inbox zero as quickly as possible, simply by just deferring email to other places where it makes more sense. Like, is it referenced? Great, it's going in notes. 
Is it a task? Okay, great. It's in my task app due two Tuesdays from now. Um, so they're, they're just like, uh, that is an integral app that I live inside of uh, hourly almost, it seems. Um, the other developer I want to call it is called MacPaw, and they're um, specifically making software for the Mac. Um, you know, I'm, I usually don't suggest that people look for like cleanup or virus software if they have a Mac, but um, MacPaw is an extremely reputable Mac developer, um, group of Mac developers, and they just really understand how Mac OS works. And they make a great app called Clean My Mac, which is really good. It's got like a one click button that sort of scans a bunch of various different volumes on your hard disk and sort of smartly looks at like where the junk is that you don't need. And it, you know, it understands what actually your system does and doesn't need and very, very cautiously and carefully and dependably um, can save you some extra space. Not only that, though, it can like re-index Spotlight. It can clean out unneeded files inside of the mail app. Uh, it can safely uninstall apps. Because, you know, like if you do get something on the Mac App Store, you can just delete it. And that counts as an uninstall. But like if you're using something like an, the Adobe Suite, which has a more complex uninstall, um, it's got like an easy way to uninstall lots and lots of software from varying different locations on the web all at once. It's just, they're just really great. But what, they, what I really like is they also have a service called Set App. And it's kind of like a Netflix for Mac apps. You spend, um, I think it's 10 bucks a month, but you can actually apply for an educator discount, which I think it's like five or six bucks a month. And it's got, I, I mean, like I use at least 10 apps from this. It's got, I think, how many apps does it have? It feels like almost a hundred apps are in a part of it. Let me just see what's, if I can find all of them. Um, uh, I, there's at least 10 that I use on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm just scrolling through the long list. It's got to be at least 100. It's a lot of apps. Um, I'll just name, count out a few. One of them is called uh, Yoink, which when you start dragging a file on your hard drive, it a little shelf appears on the left and you can like drag an item to that shelf and just kind of leave it there and like a sort of a temporary workspace where you can drag some work, some stuff, and then you can later like drop it into an email. Um, there's something I called use called Downy, which allows you to take a video or an audio snippet from a website and just download it as an MP3 or a video file to your downloads folder. Uh, and that exists as an extension for Safari and Chrome as well. Um, let me, I'll do, give you one more. Um, there's another one called Permute, which is like the easiest to use file conversion app that I've found. And these are all like, you know, 30 or 40 buck apps, but like for, you know, six or $7 a month, you just have like, a ton of like really, really well-made and specifically curated apps for the Mac that all do like basically solve these little like um, niche kind of like pain points of using Mac OS. Uh, there, oh, there's another one called CleanShot, which makes screenshotting super powerful. Like it saves your screenshots in a temporary zone in the lower left corner of the screen and you can like pin them, annotate them without even like saving them anywhere. And then you can copy them to your clipboard and then, cl you know, drag them into a text message or an email or, um, save them to a specific location on your hard drive. Just tons of little little things that like, um, I'm the only scratching. I mean, there's gotta be at least 10 other apps from this collection that I use daily. So uh, major shout out to Riedel and MacPaw and all of their many, very, many fine apps. Probably that wasn't too much. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sitting here um, like making notes, uh, taking some notes about all that stuff. Um, yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, because as you were talking, I, you know, I pulled the uh, setup up on my end. And yeah, it's definitely one of those when I looked at it, I was like, oh my gosh, why haven't I heard of this before? So yeah, thanks for that, Jared, because I, I can't wait to dig it. And, you know, this, and I, this is like part of my lesson plan uh, for one of my early, you know, what is music technology lessons with my students. Uh, and I'm dating myself a little bit, but it's true. Like, I, I vividly remember when Michael Jackson's Thriller album came out that I had to get my mom, I wasn't old enough to drive yet, I had to get my mom to drive me to the mall. Um, like, you know, the mall opened at like 9 a.m. And like we got there at like 8.30 a.m. And already there was a line 
from the record store inside the mall, you know, twisting down through the mall to the, the entry doors outside and down the sidewalk. And I went and got in line and stood in line uh, for like, I don't know, probably like two hours. And when you finally got into the record store, they had these big bins or boxes that they would ship these albums in. And that's all they were, they were just, you know, people were just coming in to, to buy an album. And, you know, so I finally get my, uh, you know, my thriller album. And, uh, but even once I get it, it's like now, okay, I've got to find a, a pay phone to uh, call my mom and, and tell her to come pick me up. Right. Uh, so I could get back home to actually, you know, be able to listen to it. And, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll tell the kids, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm so, I'm so angry at you guys because, you know, today, if there's a new song or a new album, all you have to do is pull your phone out and click a couple buttons and you're listening to it in a matter of seconds. Um, I said, you know, back in the day when there was a new, you know, a new album, like you had to be committed if you wanted to be one of the first to get your hands on that album. And even as an extension of that, when Michael was doing the Thriller tour, uh, so I grew up in South Carolina, he was only playing uh, one location in Columbia, South Carolina. And I remember if you wanted uh, to get tickets to that concert, there was a day where you had to buy a copy of the state paper. And so in South Carolina, the, you know, the state paper uh, is newspaper is distributed around the state. So you had to get, I think it was like a Sunday edition or something. You had to get that edition of the state paper. And then there was like a one page, uh, form that you had to fill out and mail in to like in the mail to get your name on the list of people that they were going to draw from just to have an opportunity to get a ticket to the show. Um, because they were like, there's no way we're just going to open like a ticket window somewhere because it's going to be a mass of people. So, you know, even that, I, you know, it's, I don't, even though the, the convenience that technology brings us is, is wonderful. Um, yeah, it's hard to describe or even compare, uh, anything that happens today, like what was going on, um, uh, in the early eighties when, uh, that album came out and, uh, MTV was just, uh, just getting started, um, that there was much more of a sense of anticipation uh, well, in those things. I think with regards to music, that, phone with regards to music, album and, and concert going, I actually think that's exciting. I, I think you know, I miss I miss an element of that. This was another maybe like sort of ethical and maybe also pandemic induced kind of decision here. But like I just started buying music again, and I and you know the the utility of like an Apple Music or a you know a Spotify or one of these services for a music teacher is uh, as much as I don't really appreciate what the artist how the artist is treated in any of these agreements it's really hard for me to pass up the ability to stream something from a music player on command so you know i'm still an apple music subscriber um but i decided you know we we bought a record player and i did some tech nerd stuff and hooked it up to our we have some sonos speakers in our house and i you know i hooked it up so that most of the rooms in our house can not only can they play stream music from a couple different streaming services but they can you know the the records will play all around the house and and that so we've been you know I wouldn't say like I'd become like a hardcore collector, but at least once a month, we're you know something that we're listening to a lot. We'll, we'll go out and buy a copy if it's available, um, or I'll buy a shirt or some art poster artwork or something. Um, and that's been like um, a lot of people kind of you know there are people out there who would make fun of me for like you know because like records are like not the same audio fidelity or you're just being a fussy hipster or whatever. But like there's there's a part of it that kind of brings back that excitement of having a thing holding a thing in your hands and having it sort of like a physical manifestation of the art that you love you know being with you and there's a feeling of you know of, of actually having to take a real action to get it <laughs> in your hands like i have to go to a store and find it i mean going to record shopping is like genuinely very fun like i'm in there and i'm like oh i've never seen this live miles davis record let me and i have the power of the internet still so it's like i google it and i'm like oh i'm learning new things that i wouldn't be learning if i were like not being discerning about how i was spending my money so i don't know it, it it's kind of brings me back to a place back when i had to you know go go buy my own music a little bit yeah and and this may uh could fit into maybe your your the tech tip or app or or whatnot but something that i did 
I'm, I'm going to kind of meet you halfway between what we were just talking about. But um, one of the things I did maybe about two months ago is I started to subscribe to Tidal um, for my streaming music. So uh, Tidal, T-I-D-A-L. Uh, and when Tidal first came out, I so the thing about Tidal is that when you get – uh, in that streaming platform, instead of uh, like what you get with Apple Music and Spotify, which is usually compressed audio, uh, they publish, they stream everything in like hi fi, uh, uh, you know, uncompressed format. And, you know, I took my, uh, my, because I was having a discussion with somebody, uh, a colleague that, uh, you know, sometimes a student, like I'll say to my students, you know, have you ever noticed how like great live music sounds? You know, there's just something special about actually going to a live concert. And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, part of the reason for that is because the music we listen to, you know, through our, uh, our headphones or whatever, like we actually, when you go to a live performance, you're hearing sounds we don't usually get to hear because it's all compressed and we don't even know, um, you know, what that uncompressed sound is. And so I started, uh, so anyway, so I started with Tidal and, uh, and I had my wife, uh, in her car because her car actually has, uh, you know, pretty decent, you know, speakers and sound system. And so I pulled up Spotify and I pulled up Tidal, um, and I would play excerpts from the same song back to back and let her listen to the difference. And, it's certainly more noticeable on, on some tracks than others, but you know, her eyes just like got wide when she was like, Oh wow, there is a difference. I'm like, yeah, there is a difference. And the other thing about title is their format uh, is much more favorable to musicians than as far as compensation than, than Spotify is. So, but you know, the thing about, uh, so I would definitely recommend Tidal, but if you're going to get it, like you can't just listen to it through your, uh, you know, just your, your AirPods or, you know, a lot of times people get beats by Dr. Dre and think that they've got like really like high level headphones. And it's like, yeah, no, not really. But, you know, if you get uh, like, you know, a really good set of headphones or, you know, speakers, um, I think it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Would you call that your tech tip of the week that could be my tech tip. i should probably at this point just interject and let our listeners know that at some point in the last little bit of this show you started listening to a recording a separate recording (laughs) from the rest of it we have been recording this episode slowly over the past couple of months and uh we got the last time we met we got all the way up into the album and the tech tip of the week and then i i think i had to like go do bedtime or something or some something caught us up and then i know we've the school year got the better of my time you were on vacation last week like we you've actually been extremely flexible and i've just been a mess so uh thank you for for being back here and um yeah i think we're gonna we can certainly do if you title is you know an app a service but it's also a tech tip i mean i i'm happy for you to share another one as well if you want to yeah well you know like i said that app is i would definitely recommend to to you know, and, you know, if you got, uh, you know, even like you were mentioning with records, the records are great too. Uh, if you've got a hi-fi kind of sound system to play them through, um, cause it does make a huge difference. So that's kind of like my personal, um, you know, app that I'm into, uh, you know, right now. Uh, the other thing, you know, I would call it a tech tip, but like sitting behind me right now, I think I have like five different versions of the Novation Launchpad. And one of the things that I've sort of been working on uh, for my students and uh, some of the presentations that you know I'll do from, from year to year is sort of rethinking what we consider to be musical instruments uh, and how we sort of rethink uh, how we... Th- think of like notation and theory and that sort of thing. So uh, I've been, uh, one of the things that's cool about these launch pads, you know, they were originally developed as sort of a, uh, 
econ economical um, option rather than using the Ableton um, push, I think it's what it's called. So, uh, so they were designed to be used with the Ableton software and they're, they're great when it comes to using Ableton. Um, personally, Ableton terrifies me. Uh, well, it doesn't really terrify me. I, what I figured out is ultimately the problem I have with Ableton is it's so, there's so much information in the window that I have to get my face like really close to the monitor to even read everything uh, because I'm getting older and I don't like wearing my glasses when I should. So it's just really small. So, but anyway, so this launch pad was developed by Novation to be an option to the Ableton push and, and controlling Ableton. But the thing about it is at its core, it's just a MIDI controller. It sends MIDI data. So what I'm working on right now is how this launch pad can be used with really anything that takes MIDI data. So you can use the launch pad in GarageBand. You can use the launch pad in Logic. You can use the launch pad in Soundtrap. You can enter data into NoteFlight. Um, using the launch pad so and it's really cool because you can set it up so that it operates like a piano keyboard um, a little differently but I'm working on sort of a, a pedagogical approach of how to rather than trying to teach my students like how to play a piano in the notes and names of the piano keyboard how to teach them the scales and, and modes uh, using the launch pad. So if you haven't checked out the launch pad uh, by Novation, I, I think it's a really, it's super versatile in how students or anyone can use it to create music from, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's an eight by eight grid pad controller. So it's, you know, 64 pads, but you can use it to create drum beats. You can use it to create, melodies and like in logic pro it's so cool because you can go into logic pro and set up the arpeggiator um, or something similar in logic pro where like if you just press a single key it'll create a chord um, and using sort of the key mapping like you can assign a, you know just a single octave of notes to trigger chords so the thing that's cool about the notepad, like the students can actually play chords in one area of the pad with their left hand while they're improvising melodies uh, on top of the chords with their other hand. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm sort of digging into using this uh, Novation Launchpad as sort of a, or creating sort of a methodology for teaching that as a musical instrument that can be used um, you know, beyond Ableton. Yeah, there's something nice about a colorful grid of squares that's infinitely flexible. I have, um, over the past couple of years, I ended up acquiring uh, a Push 2 and have been really trying to, like, learn it, you know. And the thing that is cool about it is that it's, it is um, easy to adapt to lots of different scenarios, um, for sure. Um, yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool input device, and more. I think more of the DAWs are kind of getting hip to this idea that people want to do kind of the nonlinear clip editing, which is the you know like where you sort of trigger independent clips, uh, you know, either in, instead of you know as a way to live perform or in combination with sort of as like a first step to a workflow of a more linear uh, you know kind of view where the music timeline moves from left to right. You can sort of have all your ideas scattered around and trigger them with those nice colorful squares independently. I, yeah, because it's, uh, you know, even Logic now has, you know, I, I call it their Ableton mode. Um, I think Logic refers to it as uh, um, live loops, the live loops sure. mode in Logic. Um, and I do like that Logic, so, Lo Logic's user interface for them makes more sense to my brain where there's like each little square is depicted as like sort of a waveform, but the waveform is actually the shape of a loop, like a circle. And you sort of see it play out in a circle. It just makes more sense to me a little bit. Like you can kind of see the status. Because like what I have, when I use the push in Ableton, my loops might not be the same length as one another. Like one of them might be one measure long. One of them might be four measures long. Uh, one of them might be, you know. And so like logic sort of shows you, well, Ableton does too. It ha it, you can sort of see this, the rectangular clip shape sort of like high, like it sort of um, lights up. Uh, in real time with like where in the timeline you are. But I, I don't know, the logic one makes pretty good sense to my brain. 
Yeah, and I, I think it's really, uh, uh, I think it's pretty cool the the launch pad or the push uh, that you could, because uh, I teach middle school students, so and we start with GarageBand, um, but I think it's really pretty cool because you can take it from GarageBand to Logic to Ableton as they get. Uh, you know, more in depth with, you know, production and sequencing and mixing and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but the device, um, like the Launchpad Mini is great uh, because it's, it's super light. It's not very, it's not very big at all. Uh, you can't quite fit it into your like pants pocket, but it would be super easy just to drop it into a, a pocket in your book bag. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's great for a garage band. Um, but like once you get into logic that the launchpad mini becomes limited um so you know but if you go from the mini to like the launchpad x um you know the x has much more functionality what you need when you get to logic um and then you know so it's it's i think it's cool because it's like the instrument kind of grows with the student it's kind of you know i relate it to like you know th that beginning level uh clarinet that you buy for you know beginning band and you know you can move up to an intermediate instrument and then you know the professional model um and i think that's kind of the same thing with the the launchpad mini the launchpad x and then you know really the professional model is that is actually getting the ableton push if you're going to be using it in ableton which is um a great device but they're not cheap i think i, I think uh, of the push either. as distinct from these other devices only in the sense that it is like sort of an interface for specifically the features of Ableton. So it is an, if you think of Ableton as an instrument, the push is like really the only one of these things that can play it in its entirety. Like there, are, there's almost a way to do everything that you can possibly do in Ableton, which is um, kind of, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it is the kind of situation though where I, I do wish that it was, um, you know, I wish that there was some sort of hardware device designed specifically for every DAW that I have. Not that I would want to have to go out and buy something as expensive as this for every DAW, but I, I like the idea that the software down to its even deepest feature sets is like something that I can do. I can do, I mean, I can even do it without the app being in the foreground because I can just kind of situate the, the push. I use it sometimes in private lessons as a way to sort of like, um, instead of a metronome, just to sort of like improvise, like in real time, like, you know, beats and loops along with my students when they're practicing very repetitively. It sort of makes, I don't know, I try to make it feel a little bit like they're at a DJ show or something. <laughs> you know, they're like uh, something, something, oh yeah, anything, yeah, I mean, anything definitely. other than just a click, 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 click for, you know, the amount of hours. Cause some of them really do um, not appreciate quite how many times you need to repeat something on an instrument to form a physical skill. So if, if ever I feel like I need to illustrate that repetition for them in the time frame of the lesson itself, even though they really should be doing that at home, um, I'll tr do anything I can to keep that interesting for them since uh, I have the power to do so <laughs> right at my own home studio. Yeah. yeah. Well, my tech tip is more productivity based. And this is, I realized this isn't going to be for everyone, but I came into a situation where it was something that I recently recommended to some colleagues of mine. Um, so uh, time tracking is, is something I've been experimenting with for the better part of the last year or two, a little bit more seriously than in the past. Like it's one of those things that never sticks for me. And it usually never sticks because if you're going to track your time, you have to be constantly remembering to start and stop these timers or else you don't get an accurate representation. And there's a lot of things I don't really need to track that, but though tracking them gives me, um, helps me to sort of do more personal reflection on how I spend my time. So things like how often I spend time lesson planning or like teaching or private teaching. And this can be really, really helpful information to have. But then of course there's like lots of specific freelance projects um, or even like, you know, projects like the one that uh, I'm thinking of now, which is I've been curriculum writing for my school district and we are all required to track our time because it's virtual. We're not actually just going to the same building as each other as has been done in previous years where we're just sort of like by nature of needing to be in the same room. That's the time that we're getting paid for. Um, so I've been using an app called Timery for the past couple of years. It's an iOS and Mac and Apple watch app. That is, it's actually a front end for a service called toggle. So if anyone out there wants to do this for free, cause I think Timery is free, but has some, premium features that I'm about to describe, but you can get this ex most of this experience by going to toggle.com. I'll link it in the show notes. And it's basically a, a service that tracks 
your time. You set up projects, you set up tasks within those projects, and then you trigger these, you kind of toggle on and off these different timers. Um, but what these apps do, particularly Timery, is you log in with your toggle credentials, and then Timery is just like a way more powerful and pretty interface for dealing with it. And these details matter when you're trying to address some of these issues. So some, th some of the things that Timery does is, for example, um, it's like very intuitive to use. So you don't feel like you're doing lots of clicks to run your stuff uh, and set up new timers. It also will show you your currently running time in the menu bar of your Mac. It has uh, great widgets for all iOS platforms. So I, on my iPad and my iPhone's main home screen, just to have a little widget showing me what timer is currently running. And um, you can like have the window always float on top on the Mac. So no matter what I'm doing, the timery window stays visible. So I don't forget if I'm running a timer. It's got swipe gestures. Most importantly, it has shortcut support. So I actually can automate these timers by um, where, you know, like I can program my phone in the shortcuts app. I can say like, when I arrive at work, start running my work timer, which is basically the timer I use when I'm like at my desk, kind of lesson planning and answering emails and things. Um, when I'm in teaching mode, when I like trigger into like, um, I have a focus mode on my iPhone for when I'm teaching, which only allows my, uh, teaching, you know, the music team notifications to reach my phone. But what it also does is when I turn on that focus mode, it starts a timer called teaching. And, uh, it's great because I'm, you know, I'm timing this conversation right now and I'll have a really accurate view at the end of the month. Like how many hours did I spend recording this show? How many hours did I spend editing this show? And it's kind of a nice reflection tool. And having the app constantly just visible to me everywhere, even now on my watch face, is a great way to not only remember to start and stop the timers, but uh, I think this app makes it as easy as possible to actually do the act of starting and stopping the timers. So I recommend Timery slash Toggle is the underlying service. If people don't immediately understand that, it's kind of like how if you use like the Mail app Outlook or like the Apple Mail app, you can use those apps for any email service so like you can use a gmail email account but you can like plug it into your apple mail app or your outlook email app or, or whatever your email app is of choice so timery is kind of like the client it's the app but toggle is the underlying service and they have their own apps too uh, i just don't like them very much they're kind of ugly and weird so anyway that's me timery slash time tracking. Yeah, it's good. I automating it, making it happen automatically was the was the winning ticket for me. Is like a lot of my timers just automatically start. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Um gosh, I wish I could remember the rest of this conversation so that I could more adequately close us off here for the recorded part of our conversation in any way, but um do you want to tell people where to find your stuff online? Like where are you where if someone wants to like talk to you further learn more about you read your book your any of your online stuff like your podcast like where, where are some places people should be directed towards uh well you know probably the most central uh, locations of my website which is www.mutechteachernet.com so that's a truncated version of music technology teacher network mutechteachernet.com and you can also email me directly uh, just at heath at mutechteachernet.com. Um, and I do have a YouTube channel where I've got tons of videos that I've created. Uh, a lot of them are videos that I've, I've created for my students that I use in class. Um, so if you just go to YouTube and search Mutech Teacher Net, uh, you should be able to find it. And uh, it's always awesome to, if you like it, share it with your friends, you know, subscribe, uh, you know, that always kind of helps out. And then, yeah, the, uh, my, the book, uh, music technology 101 was published, uh, it's been out a little over a year, but you can find music technology 101 either on the Hal Leonard website or Amazon, or you should, you know, your local, uh, you know, music, uh, dealer distributor uh, would should be able to order it for you if you would like to order from your your local um, uh, music store, which is always something I encourage people to yeah, do. Yeah, totally. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for recording with me three times, and um, I'm looking forward to you know I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out here, but not actually get off the line. Um, looking forward to seeing you in person at the next the next music conference. Yeah, me too. And I appreciate you so much, 
uh, taking the time to have me on your podcast. And I really appreciate um, all the things that you're doing and, and the resources that you're putting out, uh, you know, for teachers and, uh, uh, and stuff to use. It's been, you know, super helpful. So uh, thanks for letting me be a part of that. And, and, and thanks for all the other stuff that's out there that, that, that I use and reference uh, quite often myself. Today, I would like to introduce you to my Scale Exercise Play-Along Tracks with Trap Beats, available for sale at RobbieBurns.com. Trap Beat play-alongs include over 72 audio recordings, each of which includes a count-off, a trap beat at 70 beats per minute, and a tuning drone playing both the tonic and each note of the scale in just intonation, so your ensemble can learn to play in tune, develop steady, sustained tone, and blend with other sounds. These drones are stacked over top engaging trap beats that help students to practice at slower tempos while developing steadiness of time and a better concept of how the beat is subdivided. The scale exercises include whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, scale and thirds, and a mini scale with an arpeggio at the end in all 12 keys. I have also included three speed variations of a Remington exercise, so band ensembles can work on their favorite tone and technical exercises, whether they be from a method book or of your own invention. The tracks are $15, but for $40, you can get the stems to the tracks in Logic Pro and GarageBand format, so that you can do things like Speed them up and slow them down. Change the pitch. Add your own accompaniment. Take out my voice and add your own. And two, and three, and go. Or even sequence the tracks together to completely automate your ensemble warm up. These tracks are perfect for running through your Google Meet, Zoom, or virtual teaching platform of choice, or for running through the loudspeakers at the beginning of your in-person rehearsal. Check them out now at robbieburns.com store. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash musicedtechtalk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks to this week's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out. Thank you.